Uh, my name is Wyatt Shields. I'm the city manager for the City of Falls Church. Uh, I'm glad that you all are here. And uh, we're going to kick things off first with our, with our mayor, uh, Mayor Dave Tarter, who's going to make some welcoming remarks. And then, uh, then uh, Superintendent Tony Jones and I will make some additional introductory remarks. And then we'll go through uh, an agenda that we'll describe in a little bit more detail when we, when we do our introduction. Uh, mayor Tarter. Thank you very much. I understand they want us to use the microphones this morning. So uh, is the microphone on? I don't know if we need it or not anyway. Um, welcome to the City Falls Church. Uh, I'm delighted to be here with you this morning, and more importantly, I'm delighted to see so many of you uh, here with me. Um, I think it's a very exciting opportunity, both for the city and hopefully for you as well. Um, we all appreciate your interest in the city. I thought I'd start by just giving you a little bit of background, set the stage a little bit about how we ended up being here today. Um, the parcel that we're talking about is in total about 34 acres. Originally, it was part of Fairfax County, but owned by Falls Church City and the Falls Church City Public Schools. In settling some water, the litigation related to our water systems uh, several years ago, as part of the settlement, there was a boundary line adjustment. So the property we're sitting on today, which was in Fairfax County several years ago, was brought into a City Falls Church. And part of that settlement was that 30% of that property could be used for non-school purposes. So that coincided with the need the city had for increased school facilities. Our population, and particularly our school population, has been growing over the past years um, significantly. So um, that has ended up uh, causing us the need to reevaluate our school. The school you're sitting in right now although may not appear that way, is approximately 50, 60 years old and um, is in need of both renovation and uh, increased school enrollment. So um, what the city did is the city and the school board got together, as did the Economic Development Authority and Planning Commission, and formed a steering committee that spent the past 18 months or so looking at this site, considering some of the possibilities for this site. We've had some work products produced. Uh, RTKL did a study for us. Urban Land Institute did a technical assistance panel uh, probably six, eight months ago, maybe a year ago or so. And then we recently had a community visioning uh, uh, process prepared with Cooper Carey uh, that gave us some additional ideas about what new facil school facilities we should be having. Um, that ended up culminating with where we are today, which is the issuance of an RFP. And the RFP has three main purposes. One is the replacement or renovation of George Mason High School, the school you're in right now, to accommodate increased enrollment. Two is expansion of the neighboring middle school, Mary Ellen Henderson, again to accommodate uh, increased enrollment. And the third item, um, which is to generate revenue for the schools to re redevelop and commercialize approximately 10 of these acres, approximately 10 of the 34 acres for revitalization, commercial development. That would be to generate revenue, income to pay for the schools. Ideally, it would pay for 100% of these additional school facilities. Create a sense of place, a special, um, you know, not run of the mill, but a special place here. It's a great opportunity, I think, for, for all of us, um, in some ways, a blank slate. Um, and to bring desirable commercial activities to neighboring areas, to essentially be a spur for economic development for other parts of the city. The site is very exciting. I mean, it's 10 acres next to a metro, next to I-66, next to Route 7, in an area that's got very good demographics for development. So we think it's a great opportunity. We're delighted that you all are here with us today. And on behalf of the city and the school board, I'd like to welcome you and look forward to working with you. Thank you very much. So I'm joined by our school superintendent, Tony, uh, Dr. Tony Jones, and uh, again, my name is Wyatt Shields. I'm the city manager, and we wanted to just make a few introductory remarks um, and then turn it over to um, our outside legal counsel, Chuck Wall, uh, with the firm of Troutman Sanders, um, and he will walk through uh, the, the process that we're following for this RFP. After his presentation, then it will come back to Tony and I uh, to talk about the scope of work and then after that, we will uh, go into questions and answers. Um, 
I would like to just take the opportunity to uh, let you all be aware that we do have a, a number of, of uh, key city staff here, and I want you just to introduce those uh, staff members for you. Uh, we have Carol McCoskery in the back, a city attorney. Uh, we have George Armstrong, our purchasing director. Our CFO, Richard LeCondre, is here. Our director of economic development, Rick Goff, is here. Our uh, engineering supervisor for transportation, Stephanie Rogers, is here. Our civil engineer for public utilities, including stormwater and sanitary sewer and, and uh, other utilities, is uh, Jason Wittstrom. And I uh, just wanted you to be aware of those uh, staff resources. Nancy Vincent and our human services team is over here to the right, uh, along with Dana Lewis. And uh, so those are uh, some, some city staff members are here. Um, we uh, are taping this event, so when we speak, we'll be speaking at the microphone, which is really for, for, the, uh, for the taping purposes. And Mike Palmer is with our, uh, our local uh, TV access is here as well to, uh, to help us with that. And Dr. Jones, if you'd like to make introductions as well. And first of all, thank you for being here. And I do want to, on behalf of our school board chair, he was going to be here today. He got called away at uh, work in Colorado. So uh, he's very excited about this process as, as well as the entire school board. We do have some uh, school staff here as well today. Mary Beth Connolly, who actually works to connect all of our schools to the business community, which in this project will be hugely important for us again. Uh, Tom Horn, who is our chief officer for legal services and all of our student activities and is an expert on everything athletics uh, field-wise on this campus. Uh, Sebi Padilla is right over here on the right side. He's over all of our facilities, uh, maintenance and operations. And then we also have John Brett, who does all of our communications back in the back corner. So welcome to all of you. And I know you want to get on with the business, so we'll turn it over to Chuck. Thank you, and good morning. What I plan to do is, is walk you through very briefly um, the procurement process and give you an overview of what we're looking at, uh, which is uh, all detailed in the RFP, uh, as you know, and it's something that I do suggest that you read from cover to cover if you are interested in pursuing this because there are a lot of, a lot of terms and um, uh, pieces of information in there that are very relevant to the project and to the procurement process. Uh, to start off with, this is being procured under the PPEA, what we call it, the Public-Private uh, Partnership Law for Virginia for education facilities and, and other types of infrastructure. And it's being conducted in a two-step process. Uh, the first we call the conceptual phase. That is what the, the current RFP is. It's a conceptual phase RFP um, representing the, the beginning of the of the process. Uh, it includes, um, in addition to explanation of the procurement process, the project goals and so forth, it includes uh, submittal information as well as evaluation criteria. Uh, following that evaluation, uh, the second phase is anticipated, which we refer to as the detailed phase. Um, that will involve uh, moving to a short list and a uh, a request for detail phase proposals. There are uh, two what we call responsible public entities involved in this uh, because it is a joint project between the city and the school board. So each of them is considered a responsible public entity. What we anticipate is a single comprehensive agreement or public-private partnership agreement that will involve both of those entities uh, plus a private party uh, with the school board obviously uh, focusing on the school facilities and the city on the uh, commercial development. Uh, let, me, let me move to the uh, schedule, which we've got a slide on, um, and walk you through that, uh, just hitting some highlights. Of course, this is outlined in the, uh, in the RFP. Uh, First of all, in terms of submitting questions, uh, those are to be directed to the point of contact, Mr. Armstrong, whose uh, details are in the RFP. That uh, deadline is September the 23rd. Uh, the conceptual proposal uh, submission deadline is October 30th. Uh, we anticipate an announcement of a short list and moving to issuing the RFDP 
uh, in December of this year. Uh, and as indicated in the RFP, we anticipate uh, forwarding no more than, than four teams. Uh, the detailed phase uh, proposal submission deadline is in March of next year. The uh, selection of the preferred proposer coming out of that detail phase proposal is scheduled for June of 2016. In the following months, we would anticipate negotiation of the comprehensive agreement terms, uh, the key terms of that, uh, then moving towards um, uh, finalizing the comprehensive agreement in the no November timeframe. Uh, the intent is to hold a public referendum in November, and then we anticipate a notice to proceed coming in December of 2016. Turning to the uh, project financing for a moment, as the mayor indicated, uh, this is an important piece as it's reflected in the, uh, in the project goals and the RFP, and I just want to focus you on those goals, uh, particularly section 2.2 uh, on page 3 and in particular section 3 of that which refers to helping to fund the cost of the new and expanded school facilities. Uh, two things about this. First of all, we want to make clear that the financing of the project in a manner that's consistent with what's outlined in those goals is a critical piece to this uh, procurement. And the PPEA process is something, is a tool that allows the city and the school board to accomplish this by uh, soliciting uh, proposals that include creative uh, ways of, of going about this. And so that's certainly something that the, uh, the city and the school board are looking for. Um, secondly, we would encourage you to, to match up what you include in the response to uh, section four, which is the content of the proposal, with those identified goals, uh, and in particular, detailing the, the costs associated with the new school facilities, um, including the alternates that are in Appendix C, as well as uh, any new infrastructure that may be a part of that. Uh, second, describing uh, any land transaction that may be involved and a schedule for when the city or the school board may be um, uh, receiving value or payments uh, with specific amounts on that. And then lastly, identifying risks uh, and risk factors uh, and commitments that would be required of the city and the school board and how the city uh, and the school board may be protected against those risks uh, associated with financing of the project as, as outlined in your plan. Let me turn back to the slides uh, for a minute to, to speak to uh, the question process and responses to those questions. Um, they are be to, to be submitted to the point of contact of Mr. Armstrong. His contact details are in the RFP. Uh, responses will be in writing. Uh, the deadline for those questions is 2 o'clock on September the 23rd. Uh, and the city and the school board will respond to uh, questions. They'll be memorialized in writing. Uh, it is clear in the RFP, and I want to underscore the fact that oral communications are not something that are binding. So please be aware of that. And any revisions uh, and addenda to the RFP uh, will be uh, posted on the school board and the city websites. Uh, lastly, I wanted to speak to public involvement and just to make you aware that as this process moves forward, there will be uh, various opportunities for public involvement. Uh, in terms of particularly the, uh, the residents of uh, Falls Church being provided opportunities to comment on uh, the project as a whole. Uh, those will be scheduled as, as things move forward, but I did want to make you aware that that is something that we anticipate will be part of this process moving forward. Uh, that is uh, the, the quick overview. There's, as I said, a lot of details in the, uh, in the RFP itself. Um, but with that, I will uh, turn it over to Dr. Jones to talk about the scope of the project.
the first thing that I wanted to just put up for you today, and I'm sure everybody in the room has probably seen this, but this is the aerial view of this property. And what you're looking at in the yellow is George Mason, and we know that our George Mason High School has a huge footprint. Uh, it's not that much bigger than our building that is white, uh, which is our middle school next door. It's just they're different ages, uh, and we're developed over different stages. So this is a very old building with a big footprint. Um, when you look at the scope of work, we do want to build or renovate um, a new high school. We also need to expand our middle school. And again, our middle school's not uh, that old. There's a great deal of information online. So we're not going to feed you 45 slides today and get into things that we know you can go out and find on your own. But there's a great deal of information on the school website, uh, also on the city website, for information that has been gathered, not only over this year, but, but going back many years. This has been something the school district's been working on for at least a decade, if not longer. One of the things that I'd like to point out for school program that I would think, especially I know there are a lot of architecture firms that are in the room today, is that paying attention to the academic wing when you're thinking about designing a new high school for Falls Church. Um, these are some uh, just key words, and there's one paragraph that's in the scope of work, and it's section 2B, and we've tried to put language in there to give you an idea of what we want. It's thinking about learning spaces, having a focus on STEAM, science, technology, engineering, arts, and math, and we are a school division who is very strong in the arts, and I say that because we're not just a STEM school, having learning pods. We want connection to the outside for our kids, green space, collaborative learning, all of those kind of keywords that you would think about. But what we're seeing in school design across the country and across the globe really right now is a lot of very creative design with commons areas, uh, open spaces, um, perhaps even creativity in athletic fields. What we're not seeing in a lot of design right now is creativity in the academic wings. We're doing a lot of school visits. We've gone out. We're looking at schools around the country. And generally what we see is you walk in and it feels like a really 21st century school until you get to the academic wing. So we are asking for some real thought because we are a progressive school district and that's what we're looking for in our academic wing. We also, with our athletic spaces, um, we are a community that, and Mr. Horn would have to correct me if I'm wrong, but probably have more state championships than any other small school district uh, in the state of Virginia. And athletics and is very connected, our fields are, to also our community use. We really share our facilities in Falls Church, and we need that synergy to continue. So the fields that we have, we encourage you to look at what is actually in the RFP because that's what we need. Um, so. That's definitely not one area that you want to think about cutting back. Um, enhancing our indoor athletic spaces for community and school. That's another thing that we would like to see more synergy for our community. Right now at our high school we have one old gym and it's in the middle of the school and it was actually the very first portion of this high school that was constructed back in the 50s and they held class, the very first classes, up in the seats. And the person who really helped get this school district started said the reason that she did that was she knew if she built the gym first that people would build classrooms. But if she started with the classrooms, they may never get the gym. Um, but that's kind of how old it is. And then we have an auxiliary gym here, but there's no seating, there's no space around that gym. So when our kids are in there practicing, they're completely close to the community. Also parking. It is important for us that we maintain at least the 500 parking spots that we have now. We know this campus is going to double in size, not only for staff and students, um, but we again, we are one of the only small school divisions in Northern Virginia, which means we play a lot of athletic teams that don't just come right down the road where they can hop on a metro or bike to a game. A lot of our teams do have to drive in and parking is important on this campus. And I know um, our owner's rep will talk about that a little bit more in a minute. Also bus parking. Uh, we do have our buses parked on this campus, um, right out in front of our middle school, and we, we just need the thoughtfulness that we don't forget that they have to go somewhere. Uh, land in this area is very difficult to come by, so while it sounds easy just to move a small fleet of 20 buses, it's not in Falls Church City. And this is actually, again, the project aerial site, the entire 34.6 acres. Um, the detail in this RFP for this conceptual phase, there's a lot in there for the schools. And I'm going to turn it over to Bob Jones, who is our owner's rep from Arcadis, and he's going to talk a little bit more about that in spe specifics. Just uh, one point I'd like to start out making about the site and why the uh, the RFP says to assume 
that you will need deep foundations for the uh, construction of a new school is that during the construction of uh, Mary Ellen Henderson Middle School, we found out that there is, was an old trash dump on the site. And it was described as a ravine that was, you know, filled with stumps and different types of debris. But it made for unsuitable soil conditions where we had to put most of the middle school on geopiers. And I think the best that we can tell is that it runs, you know, this was the area we had the geopiers. And we believe that it runs along here that was in Old Ravine because we found it again when we did the uh, stormwater management. We don't know how far that extends into the site, but that'll be a consideration that that is there and want you to know it's there. Uh, as far as the uh, scope of work, start out with the, uh, the new high school. And it's, it's written where it can be a new school or you can <coughs> renovate some or all of the existing school. And what we mean by renovation is if, if any portion of the existing school is used, that it needs to be um, demolished down to the existing structure and, and rebuilt, along with uh, a renovation of any exterior masonry. And all of the, um, all the program requirements will still be, need to be made, so that if the program requires a certain square footage for a certain space, even if you're using part of the existing school, you still need to meet the uh, square foot requirements. Uh, the RFP uh, includes the program for the school. It includes uh, an education spec, which gives uh, a detailed requirement of each space, and also a minimum level of quality specification, which is just an outline spec on what the minimum level of finishes would be. Uh, the building will be, uh, at a minimum, LEED Silver cert certified and the owner will be providing the uh, enhanced commissioning to get the, the lead silver. One of the um, preferences that uh, the school would like would be a connection between the high school and the middle school. Uh, it's not a requirement, but it is a preference. Both facilities will be operated independently but what would be liked is a, an easy, easy way to access to move back and forth between the two schools for uh, shared spaces or, you know, if someone from the middle school was attending a, a high school class. So it'll be separate but easy to move between. And also another consideration is if there's any su support spaces that could be shared, be it uh, mechanical, electrical, you know, any kind of efficiency that could be uh, realized if some of those support, support spaces were shared between the two facilities. And then finally, um, the uh, scope of work will include uh, all site improvements that are necessary, which would include all uh, utilities, stormwater management, uh, parking, anything that would be required for at least for permits on the site will be required as part of the scope of work. The, um, the RFP for the Mary Ellen Henderson Middle School expansion, the RFP includes, uh, again, a program, an ed spec, and it's basically the same level of quality spec for the addition part of the school. Currently, the middle school is arranged where it has three grades, um, one grade on the second floor, two grades on the third floor. And those, those grades are arranged in pods where all the, the classrooms are arranged around a pod for that grade level. The, the preference would be is if you could figure out a way for the additional classrooms to still be related to those pods of classrooms for each grade. Now, I know it's hard since most of the classrooms are on the third floor and the addition isn't that big. It might be, uh, you know, you can't float them up there. But um, one option would be to reassign spaces inside the existing school to try and 
you know, maintain those uh, classroom pods for each grade. And also, um, as Tony had talked about before with STEAM, one of the concepts for the STEAM classroom that we would like is for the, the classroom itself to have a connection with the outside where you could move from inside the classroom to almost uh, an outside classroom space and back and forth so that a, a space outside the classroom almost becomes an integral part of the classroom itself. Uh, next item on the scope is school board administration and we have some uh, requirements for uh, the administration area for the, the school board. This can be accomplished by either adding those spaces to the high school. Um, if they're in the high school, they'll need a separate, not so much entrance to the building, but a separate entrance that goes to the admin area, wherever it's located in the building. But, um, you know, it can be part of the high school, or an option would be if there's office space in the commercial development and that it could be included in there also. Um, the, uh, the RFP goes into detail for the requirements of the athletic spaces. Uh, basically, we have a football lacrosse field, which will also be the stadium. So this is the, the main synthetic field with, um, you know, for football and lacrosse. And then there's also another field for uh, soccer and field hockey, which will also be synthetic. And that'll include the running track and all the, uh, the field events will be held at that. Uh, then there's also a baseball field, softball field, the tennis courts, and then site circulation. There's, you know, for each of the different facilities, you know, it, it'll be we need uh, vehicle and pedestrian access and also emergency vehicle access and it should be arranged where you can you know access any of the fields without disturbing the activities on another field and there's also a desire to have along these routes and quarters to the uh, athletic fields is to create uh, green spaces green learning type spaces so any any uh, any way you could work in the green space will be seen as a, a preference of the design. The uh, next item is for parking, and we want to maintain the existing 500 spaces that are currently on site. So some scheme to have the permanent only for the school use of 500 spaces. And then um, preference will be given to a proposal that can come up with a way to provide uh, shared parking. If there's, if there's a way to, <clears throat> um, if there's a way to have some of the commercial parking that would also be available for the schools, for their special events, or even if there's some of the uh, off-site uh, you know, some of the facilities off-site where arrangements could be made for uh, a type of shared parking, but some, uh, some scheme to come up with a way for overflow parking on events, and that would be considered, uh, you know, a preferred element of the design. The, uh, the final big portion of the scope is an ad alternate for a pool facility. And I think that, it, you know, there's a, there's a program and an ed spec for the pool. And this should be seen as a facility that's almost, you know, a separate community facility but has easy access from the high school. So that during the day it'll be a school facility, but it needs to be easily segregated from the school for, uh, for the community use. And as Tony um, mentioned, on the site right now, we have the school bus parking in the city mulch lot back in the corner. And if that area, it's acceptable if you can find a space off-site to move those to. 
and free up more of the site for uh, the athletic fields. So that's an option if you, there's a creative solution to uh, those two facilities. And on a final note about it, that this will, the construction will be done in an occupied uh, facility. So the high school and the middle school will be fully occupied and operational throughout any of the construction activities. So if there is some phasing or part of the high school that wants to be renovated, we need to find alternate ways to house those students on site. And there should, the proposal should um, think about safety. Um, how would the, during construction, how would the site circulation uh, be taken to keep the student population and construction <laughs> separated? Um, there's, um, you know, how are we going to secure the construction site and keep that safe? And there's also for being at a, be an active school site, any of the employees working on site during construction will have to go through a background check. And that's just verifying that none of them are listed on the Virginia Sex Offender Registry. I think the, uh, the final, um, we will be working to uh, digitize a majority of the existing documents and we will provide in an upcoming addendum a link to those documents as well as the ability to um, uh, by appointment to come to the high school and look at the full, uh, the full list of documents that will be available. Is there a what? Okay. I wasn't sure. Was question. No. Thank you, Bob. Um, I'm going to speak uh, for about five minutes just to talk about the commercial redevelopment on the site. And um, there are a couple things I want to emphasize in that. Um, in the RFP itself, we stated as our project goals, section 2.2 C that the city's goal is to maximize the short and long-term economic benefit of the redeveloped portion of the parcels to help fund the capital costs for the new and expanded school facilities and to spur further economic development. So how are we going to do that? Um, we've laid out a little bit more detail, but I think it's, it's what we can say is that on the school program, uh, the school board has laid out a programmatic uh, needs for the school and so we expect all the proposals are going to be pretty uniform in terms of of meeting that program that that minimum program on the economic development side we have not master planned this site we're looking for your ideas on how to accomplish this goal how to maximize the economic value of the approximately 10 acres that's available for private redevelopment uh, in the RFP, we state uh, the scope of work as follows. Uh, we want to do essentially three things. We want to maximize the value of the land through the transaction uh, in terms of a sale or a lease. We state a preference for a long-term lease uh, for the private redevelopment portion of the site. Uh, second, we want to maximize the net fiscal impact post-development. Uh, the city has a fiscal impact model that was developed for the city from, uh, by the firm of Tischler Bice. Uh, Rick Goff, our economic development uh, director, uh, uses this tool uh, very frequently. We're very used to this tool. We're very familiar with this tool. We would expect the proposers to present your information as to what your projected fiscal impact uh, for the project will be, but we'll also do our own evaluation based on the conceptual development plan that you provide to us. And, and uh, and then third, uh, the qualitative features that we're looking for in the, in the commercial redevelopment, we really are looking for a special place, as the mayor said at the beginning. We're looking for outstanding architecture. We're looking for a great mix of commercial uses that will uh, complement each other uh, very well. Uh, we're looking for an effective transportation improvements, access to the site and through the site. Uh, we want it to be walkable. Uh, we want lively public commercial um, spaces. 
We're also looking for, as we do with all of our development in the city, for environmentally sustainable design in terms of the treatment of, of stormwater, in terms of it, uh, a lead certification for the private buildings as well, which we typically uh, seek in our redevelopment process. And so those are our, our articulated in the RFP. Um, but beyond that, we have not developed our own master plan for the site, so we're, lo we're looking for your ideas on how to maximize the value. Uh, again, this is the site. Um, the steering committee that the mayor referred to over the past 18 months, we really look to um, answer th two threshold questions. And one was, will the site of 34 acres, does it have the capacity if we were to set aside 10 acres for private redevelopment to help pay for the school program, will it all fit? And we hired the firm of RTKL to, to do a basic site fit capacity study. Um, and this is posted on the web. It's available for you to see. Um, and it simply provides some ideas on how things could fit. Here's, here's a, a, a way in which the campus is on 24 acres and the economic redevelopment is here focused really on the, the access points on ACOT and uh, Route 7. Uh, so that's one option. Uh, they also looked at uh, private redevelopment that really is geared more towards the West Falls Church Metro, closer to that with the road access coming through uh, the WMATA property and the UVA Virginia Tech property, possibly with access through the site to access this as well as through the uh, WMATA to access roads up there. Um, these were provided simply conceptually just to see how they would fit. Would we be able to fit the athletic fields, et cetera, and the school uh, needs uh, with those different configurations? And what we concluded is, yes, it does fit. It, it is feasible. And second, the second threshold question that the steering committee wanted to uh, try to answer is, uh, will there be market interest in this site, and will it accomplish our goal to, uh, to significantly pay for the capital program for the school? And the Urban Land Institute's uh, technical assistance panel uh, concluded that, yes, there, this is a, a, a very feasible site for economic redevelopment, and that it would generate revenue um, that would significantly uh, offset the cost to the taxpayers of, of the school. They came up with a proposal where they identified the Haycock Road and West Broad Corner as being the most viable for economic development. We remain open-minded on this point. We were very much appreciated the Urban Land Institute's uh, thinking on this. But again, we're interested in what the private sector comes to us in terms of, of how this site can be best developed. We do uh, just note that there are um, our surrounding property owners, uh, just so everyone knows who is where. Um, the, the major adjacent property owner is WMATA, uh, with approximately 25 acres adjacent to the West Falls Church Metro Station. The city owns this parcel, uh, parcel four, uh, and has it under a long-term lease to UVA and Virginia Tech for the Northern Virginia Center. Uh, they have an option to purchase at the, uh, which, which begins um, in, the, in the 2020s. Um, and then UVA owns this parcel outright. Um, these parties have been involved in our planning. We've been very inclusive with them, so they know what we're doing. Uh, we've also invited Fairfax County to all of our planning sessions, um, and so they're very well aware of, of what we're planning for the site as well. The Urban Land Institute um, anticipated about 1.1 million dollars, uh, 1.1 million square feet of private development on the 10 acres. That's a FAR of, of uh, just over uh, 2.5. I think the city is envisioning probably uh, an FARs of 2.5 to over 3.0. This is a site that we believe can handle density. Um, but again, you know, we're looking for the private sector to tell us what, what do you think the market is looking for here, what will be successful here, and that is one of the reasons we did not go forward and, and, and master plan the site on our own. We wanted to get your thoughts on how best to do it and, and really treat it as a greenfield site. Um, so with that, uh, we will now go into questions and answers, and, and all of us here at the, at the front panel uh, will um, 
uh, do the best we can to answer your questions. We will record all the questions that are asked and we'll, we'll make sure that there's written responses as well so that everybody has the, the access to the same information um, and everyone's on an equal footing. So with that, um, one, one thing, since we are taping it, uh, what we'll do with the questions is when the questions are, are, are made, we'll repeat the questions so that they're in the microphone and then, uh, and then attempt to answer them. So who would like to start? <laughs> I'll also note while you're thinking of your questions uh, that our intention is to provide a walking tour of the site uh, once we're done with questions and answers and, um, and uh, we'll lead that. So after we finish this, this uh, part of it, we'll gather together and then go to specific locations on the site just so that everybody can see the site and, um, and there'll be opportunities for questions and answers there as well and we'll do everything we can in that format to record the questions and record the answers as well. Yes, sir. Um, pardon me. to a map. So there's, there's two questions. Um, one question was, has the city's engineering department laid out where the access points uh, should go for the site? And then the second question is, um, relates to connectivity to our neighbors. Is that, is that the, the question? Or could you repeat the second part of the question to make sure I yeah, have that if right? we were obviously there between us and the metro, Okay, for the first question, um, city staff have met with VDOT um, to let them be aware of the RFP, and uh, we've met with their planning staff. What we will uh, expect that the proposers will, will do is have your own transportation expertise and have knowledge of what VDOT's requirements will be for signalized or other access points onto Route 7. Uh, and the RFP does lay out if there, you know, if, if you anticipate any permitting problems, you, you should put that into the RFP and, and, um, and think those things through to the best extent possible at the conceptual level. Uh, so that's relating to access on Route 7. On Haycock Road, those access points will be controlled entirely by the city. And so, um, you, you know, our, our rule, we, will, we will follow our standards. Um, but the city will be the review authority and the permit authority for the access along Haycock Road. In terms of access through our adjacent property owners, I think uh, what we can say is that UVA and Virginia Tech, as well as WMATA, and as well as Fairfax County, are familiar with our process. They know uh, what we're trying to do. And uh, so we would encourage proposers to have discussions with them about access through their property, have discussions with them about how future road networks could possibly uh, connect with their properties. But we don't make any, uh, we can't make any commitments for those other parties as to, as to exactly how that will work. Yes, sir. I've got several. Um, you said that I heard indicated that there would be multiple parties on the client side. And my question is, if I heard that correctly, I think you're referring to the responsible uh, public entity, the RPE, and we've laid out an RFP that it will be both the school board and the city council. Let me refer the question to, to Mr. Wall if he could speak to that. Yes, as I understood the question, um, will there be a single negotiator on behalf of both the city and the school board? 
And uh, we anticipate that the answer is yes. There will be um, obviously uh, representatives from both entities involved in that, but led by a uh, single legal team. And, and you said you had several questions. Yeah, I'm, Chuck, you might want to stay nearby. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I think you can sit down. Uh, the, the site diagram there uh, shows a portion of the site actually crossing um, that broad street or Haycock rather. Yeah, this, this is Haycock Road. Yeah, so that so a portion of the site is actually on the, uh, I guess the, the uh, parking area as part of the shopping center. Is that portion of the site actually available for this development? I'm not sure what we want to do there, but I'm just asking the question. So the question is, is this uh, available uh, as part of the RFP? And the answer to that is no, it's not. This is owned by Federal Realty, and they're not part of this project. So the 34.6 acres is the, is the school board and city-owned property, which is the, the school campus. So it's everything west of Haycock Road. Is your fiscal impact model proprietary or may it be used by respondents? Um, Mr. Goff is shaking his head, and I, I believe it is proprietary. Yeah, so the, the question is, is the city's fiscal impact model proprietary or is it available to, uh, to proposers? And so the answer is it is a uh, proprietary uh, program. Um, what I think what we would like to see in your financial plan is what your projections are for the fiscal impact. And then as we go through uh, the negotiations, we can discuss how we're doing our fiscal impact analysis. Um, and compare how you're doing it, and um, we may not come to perfect agreement, but at any rate, we'll have uh, some transparency as to what the assumptions are behind our, our fiscal impact projections. Can I ask a follow-up to that fiscal impact? Do you expect proposers to submit independent third-party fiscal impact studies or simply provide our own projections of tax revenue? I don't think the, uh, the question is, um, do we expect the proposers to provide an independent third-party fiscal impact analysis or to simply provide their own fiscal impact uh, projections? The RFP does not require an independent third-party fiscal impact analysis from the proposers. So we would take your projections and we would conduct, we would conduct our own um, uh, evaluation of those as well. Yes, sir. How does the city and the board anticipate financing the construction of the school and the extension of the school in anticipation of the viability of the commercial bid being able to fund things in five, ten years in the future? So the question is, how does the city council and the school board anticipate funding uh, the school program and, and, the, and the construction program? Um, and can you repeat the last part of your question? Because the, the commercial viability of the, of the 10 acres is not going to be there for five to 10 or more years. Mm -hmm. And it's understood that you want the commercial bid to help fund the school program, but there's going to be a gap period in there. What's the anticipated funding mechanism during the gap period? Right. Well, um, if, if you read the Urban Land Institute report, that is something that they identified as, as something that, that uh, they thought would be an issue. Um, we're doing our own planning for that, but we also are interested in terms of what the proposals come in at the conceptual phase. And so we anticipate that there may be some financial plans that will assist with closing that gap. Um, we also anticipate that in, in the RFP, we lay out uh, um, a discussion of risk um, and risk allocation. And so we would anticipate that that would need to be part, we, we will be looking for that in your proposals as well. Yes, sir. So, uh, part of it is included somewhere, but why the gap? Why not just move ahead? 
If there are proposals that don't have a gap, um, then you know, that would be part of our evaluation of our proposal. Yes, sir. Uh, the RFP mentions soils, environmental, and archaeological assessments. Have any recent studies been done by the city that are available? Um, Mr. Jones or do uh, Dr. Jones? So the question is, have there been any environmental assessments or uh, archaeological assessments of the site in, in recent years? And, and, and soils and geotech. Yeah. And, and soils and geotech. Um, the most uh, recent uh, soils analysis that was done, I think, was for the Mary Ellen Henderson Middle School, which was back in about 2002 that would have been performed. Um, if we can locate a copy, we'll try and include that in the, uh, uh, you know, with the uh, existing documents. The one thing I want to point out, though, is that the borings that were taken in the middle school area, none of them hit the debris that was found in that area and so it was still unexpected when it was discovered you know it was just happened none of the borings hit that area so you know they're they're worth what they're worth and, and no separate archaeological i just didn't know why archaeological was even mentioned um, a catch-all or just no, I have no knowledge or anything uh, of that, that type in the ground. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Yes, sir. Uh, you, you had mentioned that parcel A was owned by the city, which is, I guess, just in that notch there in the corner. Is, is that potentially a flag? Whoops, I'm going the wrong way. So uh, the parcel four on this side, is that what you're referring to? I guess so. I'm not So the question is, is parcel four, which is owned by the city and under lease to UVA and Virginia Tech, is that at play? And um, the um, shorter answer is it's under lease to UVA and Virginia Tech. And, uh, and we can provide the, the lease or that the lease is a public document as well. It does have an option to purchase uh, to the lessors, to the tenants, and uh, so we view that as, as, uh, as something that gives them essential control over that land. And so we have not included it explicitly in the RFP. However, if, if you do note in the RFP, it does encourage you to think about our adjacencies. And, um, and we think there are really advantageous ways that potentially our neighbors could be brought into a redevelopment proposal, and we encourage that line of thinking. <coughs> yes, sir. Does a lot of considered opening up their, their open space parking for part of this project to increase density of development? Not part of the project. The, um, I, I think uh, you would need to contact WMATA directly to, to feel them out for that. But what we can tell you is that WMATA is interested in transit-oriented development at certain sites, and this has been a site that they have uh, considered and have done some preliminary planning for. Um, another key player in this is Fairfax County. And so I think in terms of your thinking about what the potential is on that site, those are probably the two entities that uh, would need to be consulted, um, you know, the, the, the county's comprehensive plan and land use uh, plan for, the, for that 25-acre site, um, as well as WMATA's real estate division. The, the West, uh, yeah, and so I, I think that's, that's the information very, in very summary fashion that we have on the site. Um, Mr. Stan Wall, who's just recently left WMATA, uh, but he was he was involved in the ULI study. He's been, um, you know, very attuned to uh, the process that we're undergoing, and uh, and so uh, that whole real estate division, I think, is is aware of the site and its potential.
Yes, sir. Uh, do you plan to distribute the uh, signing sheet? Uh, let me ask. Uh, uh, yes, sir. The sign-in sheet will be. Um, will we just post that on the city's website? There we go. So that you know, our kind of our go-to site on the city side for all of the information relating to this RFP is uh, City of Falls Church v. Uh, FallsChurchVA.gov backslash Campus Redevelopment, and uh, I think that site was on the slideshow as well. And we'll put this slideshow on the website as well. Yes, sir. Question on the athletic field scope. The RFP notes that the track should be around the soccer uh, and field hockey field, but I know that the existing is around the football stadium. And some of the other slides you had showed was around the uh, football stadium when they were moving it. Is that specific, or could the track remain around the football field? <coughs> Dr. Jones or Bob Jones? I think the, uh, the reasoning for the switch is just for the dimensions where the, um, an actual running track works better if it was moved to the other field as opposed to the, all the wasted space you get around the football field. So that was just more of, it's more efficient to put it on the, uh, the soccer field, but it doesn't have to be on the soccer field. Thanks. Are there any uh, further questions while we're together here in this room? Okay. Well, then um, we'll take the opportunity to, to, again, to thank you all for, for coming today. Thank you for your interest. Now, um, in terms of our tour, um, Mr. Jones, you're going to be our, our tour leader. Is that how we've got this organized? Um, I think we'll start out with uh, one question. Would there be anyone interested in a tour of the existing school, or are we more interested in the site? Is there anyone, show of hands, that wants a, a tour of this building? All right, we'll focus on the site then. Take a walk around. <laughs> and uh, what's the anticipated time for, for the tour, do you, would you say? To, to complete it? Yeah. Half hour to walk around the outside of the site? So we'll, we'll try to keep to a, approximately a half an hour for the walking tour. It may take a little bit longer than that, but uh, we want to take you both to this site and then just a quick look at the athletic fields as well. Thank you again.